Good evening. Welcome back to Cedar Creek Bible Church. For our opening hymn this evening, it'll be number 88 in your hymnals, Fairest Lord Jesus. Number 88, Fairest Lord Jesus. I'll invite you to stand with me if you're able. Let's pray. Father, when we take the time to really focus on our Lord and Savior, your blessed Son, whom you sent to, to us, our mind shrinks at it, really, um, to think about all of the things that he, through him you created. And uh, the, he sustains all of this, and one day he's coming back, and he is the ruler, uh, ultimately, of all nations, and every knee is going to bow uh, before him. And so often we think of this, this gentle, peaceful uh, man who, who was God, who walked 2,000 years ago in the Middle East, and we, we can't comprehend everything he is beyond that. But songs like this help us to focus on that. I pray that you would help us to always see his magnificence more clearly as we draw nearer and nearer to that time to be with him in eternity. We also want to lift up to you tonight, Brian, and just ask for you to bless him with the word that he brings to us. We all know that it's uh, it's difficult for those of us who don't uh, routinely bring the word to do that kind of thing. But, Lord, you have a message for your people through him. And I pray that you'll give him your peace and calmness and by your spirit, help him to give us the message that, uh, that we've come here to hear this evening. Bless our time now, and we ask it all in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Our next hymn this evening will be number 484. 484, who is on the Lord's side?
that pastor with scripture. For our scripture reading tonight, would you please turn in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 3. Once again, working our way through the different offerings prescribed for the nation of Israel under the Mosaic Covenant. And tonight we'll be reading about laws for the peace offerings. That's Leviticus chapter 3. If his offering is a sacrifice of peace offering, if he offers an animal from the herd, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand on the head of, the, of his offering and kill it at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall throw the blood against the sides of the altar. And from the sacrifice of the peace offering, as a food offering to the Lord, he shall offer the fat covering the entrails, and all the fat that is on the entrails, and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them at the loins, and the long lobe of the liver that he shall remove with the kidneys. Then Aaron's sons shall burn it on the altar on top of the burnt offering which is on the wood on the fire. It is a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. If his offering for a sacrifice of peace offering to the Lord is an animal from the flock, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish. If he offers a lamb for his offering, then he shall offer it before the Lord. Lay his hand on the head of his offering and kill it in front of the tent of meeting. And Aaron's sons shall throw its blood against the sides of the altar. Then from the sacrifice of the peace offering, he shall offer as a food offering to the Lord its fat. He shall remove the whole fat tail, cut off close to the backbone, and the fat that covers the entrails, and all the fat that is on the entrails, and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them, at the loins and the long lobe of the liver, that he shall remove with the kidneys. And the priest shall burn it on the altar as a food offering to the Lord. If his offering is a goat, then he shall offer it before the Lord, and lay his hand on its head and kill it in front of the tent of meeting. And the sons of Aaron shall throw its blood against the sides of the altar. Then he shall offer from it as his offering for a food offering to the Lord, the fat covering the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails, and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them at the loins and the long lobe of the liver that he shall remove with the kidneys." And the priest shall burn them on the altar as a food offering with a pleasing aroma. All fat is the Lord's. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwelling places that you eat neither fat nor blood. I'm sure you noticed as we worked our way through that chapter that it seems like there's a great deal of repetition. Of course, that repetition is there because the Lord made allowances for different types of animals to be sacrificed, and of course, that's a reflection of God's grace that he provides different options for people to bring these sacrifices. I don't know if the question occurred to you as we were reading, but what do you suppose a peace offering is? Different than the other offerings we've covered so far, isn't it? Is the purpose of a peace offering to atone for sin? No. It expresses fellowship and the reality of a peaceful relationship. The picture that you actually have is that you are actually entering into a covenant meal with the Lord. When you sit down to a meal with someone, usually it's because you have fellowship, because you have a, a proper relationship. And that is the role that peace offerings seem to have served in the nation of Israel. And you could offer these to the Lord voluntarily. You could do that in fulfillment of a vow. Um, you could do that as an expression of thanksgiving to God. And so there was a lot of flexibility for the circumstances under which you might bring a peace offering to the Lord. And those are the expectations, the commands that the Lord gave for how those offerings were to be made. And we'll be picking it up, Lord willing, again next week with a, with a reading of the laws for the sin offering. And we'll see what the Lord has to say about that next week. Thanks. For our last song this evening, before Brian brings the message, it will be 512, 512, My Savior's Love. 
I'll invite you again, once uh, again, if you're able to stand, please stand with me. Amen. You may be seated. Brian? Good evening. How wonderful our Savior's love for us, right? How marvelous his love for us. Uh, tonight we're going to be in two different passages. We're going to be in Acts 26. And if you want to hold, once in a while, we'll be moving from Acts 26 to Ephesians. Uh, before we start, to calm my nerves, I need to have a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for your wonderful love for us, how you came to us, and you rescued us. You showed your love to us when we didn't deserve it. We pray tonight as the word of God goes out, Father, that your word would be impactful on the hearts of those who hear it. May Jesus Christ and him alone be glorified and honored and lifted up, in whose name I pray, amen. On November 27th, 1973, 50 years ago, the most fantastic thing, I think the biggest the best thing that ever happened to me in my life, and I've had a lot of good things happen to me in my life. 
I have a great wife. I've got a great family. I've had a great job. I've had a great church. But the greatest thing that ever happened to me happened to me 50 years ago in November. You can hardly tell. I, mean, I, I look like I'm like 40, but... It, but 50 years ago, November 27th, I went to church for the first time. I had never been to church in my life that I could remember. My mother and dad, when we were younger, we were Lutherans, and when I was a small child, I was baptized as a Lutheran, but I don't remember any of that. But on November 27th of 1973, I was asked to go to church I had never gone to church before, totally out of my realm. I was a teenager who was very unruly, probably, if you ask my mother. <laughs> she could tell you horror stories. But that night, I heard the gospel. I had never heard the gospel before. And I was impacted by the gospel. Now, I didn't jump out of my seat, run down front, fall on my face, and ask forgiveness. I was scared to death because I didn't know what to do because they wanted you to come down forward, but I had never been there, so I was totally out of my realm, so I wasn't sure what to do. So I went home. That's all I thought about. What I had heard, what I had seen. And so they were having special meetings, and there was a a gentleman preaching there, his name was Ding Tooling. You know, some things you can remember, you can't remember to save your life. But I remember that day like it was the back of my hand. I went home that night, I, I lay there thinking about what I had seen. The guy had drawn a picture of what the second coming would look like and I was so impacted and I was, I can't say that I was scared, but I knew I was lost. I, I figured that out, that I didn't know what he was telling me I needed to know. So I went to school the next day, and then I asked uh, Terry Kappen, who had asked me to go to church with him, I asked him if I could go again. So I went, and where the law off, where the court offices are now, the old Baptist church used to sit there, and that's where, I, where the church was, and I can still remember before the service, before the service even started, I asked Terry's mother if she would lead me to Christ. So she took me back into the back office, Pastor Hausman's office. I can still remember getting on my knees, and I can still remember asking Jesus to be my Savior, the greatest day of my life. Tonight, I want to ask you all, what is your story? You know, we all have a story, don't we? If we've trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we all have a story. And it's worth telling. We all have a testimony of how God brought us to himself. I don't care if you're 10 years old, 13 years old, 80 years old, 60, 65 years old. We all have a story. We all have a time when Jesus Christ broke into our life. And it's worth telling. We also have a testimony after we get saved of all the great things that God has done in our lives. Think about all the great things that God has done in your life. And most of the time, we don't even expect it to happen. He just does it. How can we use our testimonies? Well, salvation is a miraculous story. It's a miracle. Salvation is a miracle. And we can use that story to tell those that don't know Jesus Christ how wonderful and how marvelous Jesus' love is. We can share our stories to edify one another. I was talking with a lady from our church, who I won't name, but... I was asking her her story one day, and she told me her story. I was so impacted by that. I didn't know anything. You know, I had known the lady for a long time since I'd been here, but I had never asked her how she came to Christ. 
And she told me, and it was a miracle how she came to Christ. And it was so edifying and so, it just filled me with joy to see how God had worked in a miraculous way in her life. Should we ever be ashamed of our story? Paul was not ashamed. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. It's the power of God unto salvation. We should not be ashamed of our story. How God, through his power, brought, him to, brought us to himself. Tonight, I would like to share with you three things that we have in common with Paul and with Paul's testimony when it comes to our salvation story. And then if we have time, which I'm pretty sure we will, uh, Paul also gives us four ways on how to maintain our testimony so that it can be powerful and that he can use it to win others to Christ. Acts 26. We're going to be at Acts 26, and we're going to start at verse 9. But before we get there, let me kind of give you some background of where we're at here. Paul, everybody knows who Paul is, the apostle. He had been arrested for preaching the gospel. The Jews hated it. The Jews abhorred him. They wanted him dead. They didn't want him to go out and tell the story of how Jesus Christ was the power of salvation. So he had been arrested, and he'd been sitting there, and he had been held in prison for two years. After two years of sitting in prison, he didn't feel like he could get a fair trial from the Jews. He knew that if he went before the Jews, he was toast because they would make up stuff, lies, and he just didn't feel like he could get a fair trial from them. And he also knew that even if he got the trial, when they talk, took him from where he was to where he had to go, he was probably not going to get there because they were going to get him one way or the other. So he appealed to Festus, who was the governor at that time, to go before Caesar so Caesar could hear the case against him. The Jews had no case against him. Festus couldn't even figure out what in the world they had against him and what they wanted him prosecuted for. So he just left him there and waited. Now, King Agrippa, who was coming to visit Festus, came and Festus was telling him about Paul and his situation. So that's where we're going to start. King Agrippa came to meet with Festus, and after being told about Paul, he wanted to meet him. So uh, King Agrippa, in verse 1 of chapter 26, said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul did. Verse 9. The first thing he does is he tells uh, King Agrippa about his former life, how he used to be. And in verse 9 of Acts 26, Paul says, Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He was living completely contrary to Jesus Christ. He would do anything to anyone at any time to be contrary to the name of Jesus Christ. He was going to do whatever he had to do to let everybody know that Jesus wasn't, that wasn't right. Verse 10, this I also did in Jerusalem and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Remember when he stood? Remember when he stood and held the coats of those who stoned Stephen and killed him? I was thinking about that. 
God had already started working in Paul's life. I know it sounds absurd that God would allow him to stand there while other men killed another man, but think of the impact. Think of the impact that that had on Paul. Stephen's testimony before him, what, what he experienced that day, that had to have gone along with him for quite a while. But he was casting his vote to put him to death. In verse 11, he says, And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and bring exceedingly enraged against them. I persecuted them even to foreign cities. And that's where we get verse 12. And I want you to think for yourself, what was your life like? before God broke into it. Hold your finger there, Ephesians chapter two. This is where I was at. I know this is where you were at, and you still may be there, I don't know. But Paul says in Ephesians chapter two, we'll start out in verse one. He said, we were dead in trespasses and sins. I was dead in trespasses and sins. You were dead in trespasses and sins. Paul was dead in trespasses and sins. Verse two, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. I lived according to the world. I didn't know any better. The world's pull was great, and I lived, the, I lived accordingly. Paul lived accordingly. He walked according to the world. We'll go on. Uh, verse 2, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of di disobedience, among whom also we all once conduct ourselves in the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. Paul said, I was dead in my trespasses and sins. I lived according to the world's rules. I lived in the lust of my flesh, the lust of my mind, the things I thought about. He was totally lost. On November 27th, 1973, at 5.30 in the afternoon, I was totally lost. I was totally lost at 5.30 in the afternoon. And then it happened. Verse 12, let's look at verse 12. First point I'd like to make tonight. We'll see this in Acts 26, 12, and 13. When God broke into Paul's life, it was totally unexpected. When God broke into your life, did you expect it to happen? Had God been saying, hey, you kind of had a pull. Hey, I'm going to church today. I'm going to get saved. I got up some, you got up one Sunday morning and said, oh, I'm going to go to church. I'm going to get saved today. When Paul when God broke into Paul's life, it was totally unexpected. Let's look at verse 12. He, they say, while thus occupied, while he was doing all these things, living his life, heading out to try to find some other people to torment, to kill, to torture, to harass, while thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. He was just on his way to do what he always did. And then it happened. We might not have had a bright light shine around us or knock us off a horse but on November 27th, I didn't expect what was going to happen to me. I didn't expect God to break into my life. I really did not. 
I was a teenager. I was 15 years old. My parents didn't really know what to do with me half the time. I was either unruly, mouthy, or both. Um, there was times my mom didn't know what to do with me. Um, they actually, in the summertime, they they because they, they didn't know what to do with me, they'd send me off to my aunt and uncle's, and I'd work all summer up north. I'd leave as soon as I got out of school, and I would come back the, like the day before school. <laughs> my mom would have my school clothes bought. I would just come back, and off I would go. I was living my life as a teenager not the best either. I mean, really, it wasn't, I didn't, I didn't think I was that bad, but I think I was as I think back on it. But I was not thinking about God for one second. Not for one second. I never even thought about it. But just like Paul, when Paul stood there with Stephen earlier in his life and watched them kill Stephen, he didn't realize what God was doing. When I was 10 years old, my mom and dad lived in Freeport. We all lived in Freeport. My parents worked in Hastings, and they wanted to move closer to their work so they didn't have to drive back and forth at night late because they both worked second shift. And so we moved to Hastings. My brother and I really didn't want to move to Hastings. My sisters didn't care, but my brother and I, we were in sports. We didn't really want to, but my parents decided to do it. And it was not a coincidence, it was not a coincidence that the house my mom and dad bought was right next to Dutch and Von de Kappen, uh, a great Christian family who liked to share the gospel. It was no accident. I was 10. I lived there for five years before I ever, they ever came after me. I don't know if they, they went before. They went after my brothers and sisters first. I don't know why, but it was okay with me. They'd go to church, I'd go to their house and shoot baskets. But for five years I lived there and I never once thought. And then one day, out of the blue, Terry Kappen asked me to go to church. So I went. And just like Paul, it was unexpected. So when, when God broke into your life, was it, was, it, was it expected? Do you think that, were you thinking about that? Paul wasn't. He was just living his life. The second thing, when God broke into Paul's life, it was a miracle. It was a miracle. Let's go on. Verse 14. And when we had all fall into the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goats. You're fighting a battle you cannot win. Verse 15, so I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. When God broke into my life, when he broke into your life, it was a miracle. I don't care if you're four years old and you ask your mommy and daddy if you can be saved or if you're 15 years old and you go to church and get saved or you're older and you get saved, it's a miracle. Jesus Christ broke into your life and the Spirit of God pulls you. You can't help it. You can't help it. You, there's something inside you that just pulls you. It's just like when I got saved that night, I couldn't hardly sleep the whole night before. And I went to school, and that's all I thought about. But the Spirit of God was pulling me and dragging me to himself. It was a miracle. It wasn't some event that just haphazardly happened. In Paul's life, his salvation story was a miracle. Jesus Christ broke into his life and he, and he knew it. He called him Lord. He knew exactly what was going on. I look at my life and when God confronted me, it's a miracle. 
we weren't churchgoers. I mean, I never went to church. I knew nothing about God. I knew nothing about God. And I can't say that I wanted to at that point. And then he came and he offered me grace. Let's look back at Ephesians real quick. Two verses that, two verses that we all know really well. Paul says in Ephesians chapter two and verse eight, he says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it had nothing to do with me. It was all God. When God broke into your life, it had nothing to do with you. It was all God. It was his grace, his wonderful grace, his precious grace. It's a gift, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Your story is also a miracle, just like mine, just like Paul's. Your story is a miracle. So number one, when God broke into Paul's life, into our lives, it was unexpected. Number two, when God broke into Paul's life and our life, it was a miracle. Number three, when God broke into Paul's life, his life was changed forever. It was never the same again. Let's look at um, verse 16 of Acts chapter 26. I'm going to go back and read verse 15, and then we'll go on. But So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise, and Jesus said it, but rise and stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Paul had an experience that day that changed his life. Jesus Christ broke into his life and his life was never the same again. How about yours? My life, it seems like, you know, it seems like it hasn't been 50 years ago. It really doesn't. But my life was never the same again. After November 27th, 1973, my life was never the same again. I didn't, all of a sudden I wanted to go to church. I wanted to be with God's people. I wanted to learn God's word. I didn't understand, I didn't understand it when I first started going. I didn't understand all of the church talk, you know, the things that we talk, how we talk, we have our church talk, and people come in and they don't always understand our church talk. I didn't understand any of that. But I, one thing I did know was that my life was different. There was something different. And my life has never been the same since. I've had things happen to me in my life that I could not imagine why God would allow it. I'd had things happen in my life that, what do I deserve to get this kind of thing? But I always knew that Jesus Christ was here with me and helping me through all of it. Paul's life was never the same again. He was no longer going to do those things contrary to the name of Jesus. That wasn't going to be his goal any longer. If you go back to Ephesians real quick, at verse three, chapter 3, verse 1, Paul says, 
He was a prisoner. He became a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He was proud of it. Chapter four, verse one, he says it again. I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He was no longer his own. He was no longer his own. He was a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And he was happy about it. He was proud of it. He belonged to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was everything to him. He also was able to experience the unsearchable riches of Christ. Think about the unsearchable riches of Christ that we have. Think about what we have in Jesus Christ. Why do we want to walk away from that? Why do we want to live contrary to that? Chapter uh, 2, verse 10 of Ephesians. Something bigger was going to happen. Chapter 2, verse 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I can't boast of what Jesus did for me. I had nothing to do with it. You had nothing to do with it. Jesus did it all. He came. I look at this as that Jesus came and he rescued me. He rescued me. He came and he rescued you. We had nothing to do with it. It was all him. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. After Paul came to know Christ, his life was completely different. Nothing about his life was the same. He didn't hang out with the same people and the people that he needed to hang out with him didn't trust him. And I'm not sure they really liked him. He was kind of caught. He, never, he no longer wanted to live by the world, by his own lust. He didn't want to do any of that. Jesus told us that we as believers in Jesus Christ need to be light. And we need to be salt. And we need to walk different than the world so we have a story that we can share with them. There's a way that God wants us to walk. There's a way that God wants us to talk. When Paul came to Christ, his life was changed. And his desire was for Christ to be everything. He was going to be a prisoner. He was going to do exactly what God wanted him to do, when God wanted him to do it, no matter what the cost was. And it was a big cost to Paul. Every day was a big cost to him. He wanted to live in a way that glorified the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone. He wanted to keep his testimony so when he sat before men like King Agrippa, King Agrippa couldn't stand there and say, well, Paul, that's... That, that's not really what we see in your life. That's really not what, what you're saying isn't how you live. What you say is what, not what you do. So in Ephesians, Paul shares four ways that we can keep our testimony strong. And we'll just, we'll just touch on them briefly. Number one, Ephesians 4, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Paul says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beg you, beseech you, beg you, to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. There, we have a calling, don't we? We have a calling. Jesus Christ paid a very, very large price so we could have heaven be our home one day. And we should walk in a way that is worthy of the calling. 
Our lives are no longer ours. I know we get up in the morning lots of times and when Janice will say to me, hey, what are you doing today? Or what are you doing on Thursday? Or That's not how it works. I have my things I'm doing, but my life is not my own. It's not about us anymore. When we come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior, it is not about us anymore. It's about him and only him. We always need to ask ourselves these questions. <clears throat> How is what I'm doing going to reflect on God and my testimony? And don't we blow it? I tell you what, I'm the biggest. I blow it so bad. I know I do it when I do it. And I still do it. Another question, is this going to bring glory and honor to Jesus Christ? Anybody that knows me, anybody that hangs out with me enough know, knows that I blow it and have blown it. But our number one thing we should do is we should try to walk worthy of the calling with which Jesus has called us. That everything we do like Pastor was saying this morning, would be honor and glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Another thing, verse 2, we need to walk with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We need to walk humble because what we have in Christ, we don't deserve. We need to walk gentle. We need to be there for one another. We need to put up with one another when it's hard. And we need to try to keep unity. When people ask me if I'm a, what my job as a deacon is, I'm not a leader in the church. That's not my job. I always tell them my job as a deacon is to encourage my pastors, be there for my pastors, and to keep unity in the church. Unity is so important. And that's one of the things you can keep your testimony strong when you're trying to keep unity and when you're loving one another and you're being there for other people. The second thing, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. We are to walk in a way that loves others as Christ loved us. Jesus commands us to love one another. If you look at John 15 and verse 17, Jesus commands us to love one another. We need to pray for one another. We need to care for one another. We need to build each other up. There's nothing worse than someone coming up to you and being negative about something you've done or said or could have done or said. Um, no one likes to be slapped across the face when it really shouldn't be done. We all have cares, we all have burdens, and we should be, if we, if we want to keep our testimony, we need to be there for one another, caring for one another, loving one another, um, helping one another. And sometimes when you help, it's hard for the other person to take help. I always say it's easier for me to help than take help. I'm more willing to come and help you than have you come and help me. That's how I am. That's how most of us are. But we're supposed to love as Christ loved us. So number one, walk worthy of the calling. Number two, walk in love. Number three, Ephesians chapter five, verse eight. We need to walk in light. Chapter 
5, verse 8 says, and this was from Al's message on Wednesday night. He spoke about this. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. There's so many things that, that can catch us up. There's so many things that can pull us away from God. There's so many things that we can do that can hurt our testimony. We don't mean it to happen that way, but there is. Things that seem right to the world aren't right. Watch TV for 30 seconds. Watch it for 30 seconds. It doesn't even have to be a TV program. It can be a commercial. We should walk in the light, the light of God's word, the light of God. Al taught Wednesday night that we were once darkness. Paul, on his way to Damascus, he was in darkness. Paul was on his way, and he was in darkness, and this great light appeared before him, and he was brought into the light. I was brought in the light on November 27th, 1973. You were brought into the light. We must walk in the light. We have to be different than the world. We have to be. We can't be on the border. We can't be on the fence. We have to walk according to God's word, no matter what the cost is. Lastly, we need to walk um, worthy of the calling. We need to walk in love. We need to walk in light. And lastly, Ephesians 5.15, we need to walk in wisdom. Verse 15 says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Where does wisdom come from? This, from God, from God's word. It doesn't always tell me every answer exactly what I want to hear, like, hey, am I supposed to do this? I can't open the book and say, yeah, Brian, you're supposed to go to this place today. It doesn't say But it gives you wisdom to know what's right and wrong, what's, what you should do, what you shouldn't do, and how God leads us. God's word is a lamp to my feet. We live in a dark world. We do. We're confronted with darkness every day. Should we do it? Should we think it's okay? Think of the things that right now that the world says is okay. And they want us all to think that it's okay. God's word is a light onto our path, and a lamp onto our feet and a light to our path. He'll show us if it's right or wrong. His word will show us that. So tonight I want to finish with two questions. Do you have a story? As I look around the room, I would say that all of you have a story. Do you have a story on how God broke into your life? You know, it's odd but I think about November 27th, 1973, all the time. I've never forgot that day, and I never will. That was the day that God broke into my life. That's my story. Do you know him? Do you know Jesus Christ as your own personal savior? Have you trusted him? So one day, heaven would be your home? Number two, if you do have a story, are you walking in a way so you can tell that story? Am I walking in a way so that when I want to tell my story, people are willing to listen and not look at me and say, what's he got to say? King Agrippa, he 
was like the king of Palestine, and King Agrippa knew Jewish traditions. King Agrippa knew who Jesus Christ was. He knew that. That wasn't the first time that King Agrippa had ever heard of Jesus Christ. He probably even knew who Paul was from gossip or whatever. But when Paul was all done, all he said was, you almost make me want to be a Christian. You almost. We have a story to tell. We can't, we can't control how people react to that story, but we should never be ashamed of our story because it is the power of God on to salvation to all those who believe. To everyone who believes, it is the power of God unto salvation. Let's pray. Father, tonight, I pray that your word would go out and impact the lives of everyone who's here. One way or the other. I hope tonight, Father, that everyone who's here knows the wonderful, marvelous truth that they're saved and they're going to heaven and they're going to spend eternity with Jesus Christ who loved them so much that he gave his life for them. Father, I also ask that you would help us all to examine our lives and help us, Father, to live lives that are different than the world where people can see Jesus Christ and him crucified. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You're dismissed.